I know you're gonna dig this. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. And now we will continue with my st studio guest, Dr. Scott Brown, with part two, professor, UCLA of African American Studies, author, and music historian. You know, as we continue the, the, this, uh, our conversation, we were talking earlier about uh, the Mississippi when mm -hmm. you were making mm -hmm. that point. And uh, so to make sure that we let our viewers know that we are on task, okay. that it starts in Minnesota. Oh, I see. You're going from the north. Okay, okay yeah. Okay, and we start in Minnesota right, right, right. and we go down. Down to up, the Gulf. Yeah, yeah down yeah. to the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So because I was Louisiana, explain yeah, no, why I was uh, sandbagging in Iowa. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> right. so that 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 speaks for the sure. volumes. You know, I know that you've done documentaries on uh, with VH1 on. Finding the funk, but more mm -hmm. importantly, I'm interested in your research mm -hmm. and, and how long have you been working on this research in Dayton? And let's get let's get into the nitty gritty of the All right. funk of okay. Dayton. Okay, that sounds good. I started probably around 2003 uh, when I uh, I already knew that I was moving in the direction of writing about music. My first book. Fighting for Us was about the history of the group that started Kwanzaa. And the last chapter is about all the bands that were influenced by the ideology of the seven principles. So I, I called that chapter In the Face of Funk. So my heart was already moving toward that. I, I came to visit Dayton. I met with a curator. Uh, Michael Sampson, I met with C. Del Carter, they really, who, from Slave, they really introduced me to a lot of other people. I think some of the early interviews with Steve Arrington, and so there's a snowball effect. You talk to one person and you develop you know, a really good interview, they introduce you to others. Now, I didn't anticipate spending the amount of time that I have. I thought this would be maybe a couple of years, but it just is such a rich, in-depth story. So I started roughly around 2003, 2004. So it's been uh, a good 12 years of research. And so beyond the interviews, there's all the archival stuff that I mentioned. The newspapers, Jetstone News, Pride Magazine, Dayton Express, the Dayton Black Press. There are um, municipal records at the Ohio Historical Society. You know, so my study is not just a study of the music, it's also a study of what we would call the sociology of music. You know, what's happening in the community that pushes the music forward. So. There's a chapter that I'm working on right now called really the um, uh, performance aesthetic or the battle of the bands aesthetic huh. in Dayton, Ohio. So there's a way that um, talent shows and youth competition spill over into music in such a way that creates opportunities for people to um, really express art at a very high level, performance level. So there are stories of interviews of people at various talent shows 
where they talk about the costumes, the choreography, you know, uh, the relationship with the radio station, WDAO. I, I was um, talking with some members of, of the group Hawthorne Express, and um, uh, in fact, uh, Billy Jones was saying how they had won this talent show at Roth, and they really threw down, and they were um, inspired by the, a performance by the Jackson 5. Um, they did a television show going back to Indiana, and they had a version of Isaac Hayes' Walk On. It's, it's, it's some serious stepping going on there. And so they came out with their show, and they really got the crowd. And they were, he was explaining to me the next day, they, the, the, they didn't announce the winner. The winner would be announced the following day on the radio station. And they were all on their way to practice in the car when they heard their name read as the winner uh, of the talent show. And I think it was a relatively small prize com compared to what we would think of. But the point is that you have a situation where local institutions validate young people's achievement and they see this in their world, that's huge. You get your name on the radio and it speaks to the autonomy that you had. So you have a local, to these days, radio stations, many of them, they stick with whatever the song list is, Clear Channel or whatever the, the huge corporation dictates and they don't have room to be engaged in community like that because they're not locally really controlled and owned in the way that they were. So I talk about in this whole chapter stories like that, stories where young people got opportunities to perform and got to really develop a kind of innovative, competitive show band style. Um, so, you know, I interviewed a lot of the artists that have actually come on here on the show. Uh, Sean Sandridge, you know, he talked about, you know, his mother, her role in getting the costumes together and his father, you his know. His father was their manager. The manager, yeah, right. Yeah, well, I think and it was the Imperials. The Imperials, that's yes. right. Yes. Yeah, so you have um, this whole story of parents as managers. Yes, that's nothing new. Right, that's case. nothing new. And uh, even with but, but that work that's being done, and you have parents who are managing groups while they're working full time. Yeah. And so that's a, an incredible story. So that chapter I'm doing on performance pulls in all those elements and then asks the question, where are the places that people perform? Some of them are in high school talent shows. There's um, certain clubs that... Um, under the right circumstances, are flexible about young people even as performers in those clubs. It, there, and there are trust relationships that develop between parents and managers, parents and clubs. Well, I know so-and-so, so this person will be all right over here. If not, you know, I know who to go to kind of thing. Well, a lot of the shows, uh, uh, a lot of times when the bands played, they would be in uh, union hall. Mm hmm Union halls, mm -hmm. and and they would you know they would get gigs for like after homecoming, right? Um, yeah, and and the proms and sure. So uh, they had opportunities in the city to uh, play. That's really what that whole chapter is about. What the following chapter of my book deals with is this real, I want to say, paradox by late. You know, talking about 78, 79, 77, that's really the period where the record industry focuses in on the self-contained band as the preferred artistic unit. So there's a moment where uh, Henry Allen, who's over Cotillion Records, also from Springfield, Ohio, too, by the way, a lot of people don't know, um, is interested to a degree that signing a group like Slave is sort of the hip and smart thing to do. So there's a period where self-contained bands, it's a short period, but there's a period where bands, uh, the Commodores, uh, you know, Earth, Wind, and Earth Fire. Wind and Fire, Parliament Funkadelic, Cameo, Confunction, Slave, you know, the Bar Case, that was the dominant unit. And that corresponds also with the period in time 
where major record labels, CBS Records, Warner Brothers, they want a bigger slice of the black music consumer market. This is the result of a report that's commissioned called the uh, Harvard Report. The, the end result of that is there's a moment where bands are the thing to sign and Dayton groups really benefit from that window. Uh, the paradox is that by the 1980s, just a few years later, the very local structures that made it possible for these groups to develop, doing all the performance things we were just talking about, are being undermined by the onslaught of deindustrialization, the movement of jobs abroad, and uh, misguided uh, integration policies. Those, that's like a double whammy. Um, and we're all, it's important to say that because we're always, People talk about, in these nostalgic terms, about the past, but we also have to talk about what happened, you know, that change. It's not just a question of the music being better. Social conditions changed. But so, so when you have groups like Sun getting a record deal with Capital because of the black music division that uh, Larkin Arnold is over, right? All of that is a perfect window of opportunity. So live bands are preferred. Black music divisions are popping up with labels that prior had very little interest in black consumer markets. And the band is, for that moment, a preferred unit because bands typically have songwriters in them. They can, be, so they can do a lot of different kinds of things. Something happened with the demise of black music divisions, which eventually, after Michael Jackson shows the world how much money can be made, black music divisions start shrinking and then the black artists end up being swallowed up into pop, sometimes they call it urban. But the point is, is that black executives start to also decline right alongside the decline of the band. So just as there's a perfect window, there's also a perfect storm. So we get to a point by the 1990s where there's probably only two self-contained bands in black popular music, Tony, 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 and Mint Condition. How do we get from the period in which the bands were the dominant form to now this reality that I'm talking about? And that's part of the story as well. So after you get into what's happening locally, I get into what's happening at the macro level with the industry that makes for all these groups to get signed and have this tremendous cultural impact. You know, albums. Uh, I remember, you know, being able to engage an artist visually. We didn't really have, I mean, of course, you could get, you save up your money, Maybe you can get seven dollars and make it to a concert. That $7. was a, that was a lot of work. That was a lot of work getting some you know saving up for that. Um, they might appear visually on television. Uh, maybe Don, if you if you could stay up late, Don Kirshner's rock concert or Soul Train or Dick Clark or Dick Clark. But the album was a visual relationship, and the album art that came with it. Uh, so all of that was a, a wonderful time for us, but it transitioned very quickly. Video also, the rise of MTV. The charisma of funk bands never really found a space in the video world. So what you felt when you saw a Earth, Wind & Fire concert or a cameo concert when they were a big band cameo. Never made it to video. Video was a downsizing thing. Now, there are lots of rock bands that got played, but there were not. So your big groups like Earth, Wind & Fire, their last big hit was in 1980, uh, Let's Groove Tonight, with the horns and, and uh, vocoders. But Earth, Wind & Fire never really found a space as brilliant as they were 
But the industry, MTV, was also very hostile to black music and not investing in creating ways for people to understand the brilliance of these bands. So that also had, a, had an impact uh, on the decline that takes place. But there are a few groups that survive. Uh, and incidentally, um, one of the biggest groups from Dayton, Ohio, Zap, of course, and Roger Troutman, had a formula for surviving the 1980s, but many of the big horn bands did not. Not, not just in Dayton, but nationwide. We see the decline of the big horn bands in the uh, 1980s. And, you know, just to interject a point there is that I really, because I grew up during that era, mm -hmm. I really miss a band. You miss a band. I miss, I mean, and that's why, you know, like if Earth, Wind and Fire come mm -hmm. around, uh, and even the white band Chicago, it, it, they still have the horns. But whereas most of your bands now is two or three guitars of uh, different sounds, you know, the bass and things like that, um, a keyboard, mm -hmm. which which can do all of that, right? All of that, and and then you have your drummers. Yeah. So to to have the experience of a horn, it, right? It. it uh, in your music, and I mean that's one of the that things. used to be required. A horn section, at one point. I mean, I mean, you think of James Brown. You think of James you got to Brown have the and horns. that horn. horns, Earth, and, Wind, and Fire. Um, you know, and, and so all these groups had that large size unit that was able to capture every angle that your eye could see, while also feeding your ears at the same time. And, and what I am suggesting with my book is also an advocacy position as well. One challenge that we deal with when it comes to our veteran artists is that it's great to interview them and talk about the golden age. But oftentimes, when I interviewed so many artists, it would end with, hey, here's my CD now. Listen to what I'm doing now. And there are not sufficient venues for new music made by veteran artists, veteran black artists. It's almost as if we're saying, you know, you were okay in this period because that's the period I want to remember you, but we don't want to hear how you interpret the world today. And I think that part of the advocacy of the book, which is also a kindred spirit along with the agenda of the Funk Center, is to give voice for teaching the history, but also to connect us with the, a part of the present that is also ignored. Uh, I think we had a period in the 1990s where started with the Sinbad, uh, Aruba festivals, which is now spilled over into, you know, you have the Soul Train Cruise now, you have uh, old school music festivals, you have this way that funk is a part of nostalgia and memory. I think the challenge in my work and the challenge for the wider project is for it to move past nostalgia to also blazing new trails for bringing in veteran artists and also bringing in younger artists that are mentored by them. And so to try to let that circle be unbroken. And you, um, I, I really believe that you are on track with this and because when you think about um, history, mm -hmm. and history is nothing more than history, mm -hmm. and and so we as a people normally are uh, not as good as capturing our story. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think that the, the funk, uh, the genre of funk mm -hmm. uh, from, from James Brown and back, mm -hmm. and, and, and no matter what music you hear, there is some funk in it. That's right. And uh, and, and mm -hmm. even the, the, to go back to where did all this stem from? Well, well we have to go back to the original roots mm -hmm. of yeah. African American right. people from Africa. Africa. That's right. And the Caribbeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so all of that mixture 
comes sure. together that gives us, you know, and, and because of capitalism, mm -hmm. that's how they've tried to break up our music into this mm -hmm. genre, that, you know. Right, that. right. But, 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 but at the end of the day, it's, sure. all, it's all kind of funky. And the thing is, is that the artists themselves typically don't relate in those kinds of pigeonholes. No, they don't. Right? So if you listen to a group like Slave, which has a horn section, but then they got Drac on guitar doing some Jimi Hendrix, Ernie Isley stuff screaming on top alongside these vocals, alongside everything else. And somebody wants to call them this, somebody wants to call them that. But for them, it's just artists dealing with a vibration. They're playing music. They're playing music. They're and playing I think music. You're, you're, you're absolutely right about it. And that's where I think moving funk from... We, we have a certain set of ideas about what we have for the funk sound as a genre. But funk is also a bigger philosophical concept. And it's an approach. It has an edge. It embraces sometimes contradiction. You know, it, it smells, but it's beautiful at the same time. You know, there's all these ways of funk being a part of the philosophical and cultural landscape of black life and so there are other scholars that do work in that area as well i've sort of wanted to deal with this community case study as a way of saying how special dayton is but also as a way for saying look at how special so many working class communities are across the country and that to use this story to give the tools to look at who you are and then also think about ways to form a real bridge that creates the kind of empowerment of young people that we once had in our communities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because and so many times that the public school system now is not able to provide the the, the band experience because mm -hmm. uh, parents may not be able to afford the instrument it, it, budget sure. cuts and yeah and, and and I really believe arts and music is the I is the soul mm -hmm. of your heart mm -hmm. and because no matter what language you you speak or what nationality music brings you together absolutely you know, even the most racist people will mm -hmm. sit together to listen to some jazz and it doesn't really matter who's up there even if they're black and white but it, for that moment they're there mm -hmm. if they like the funk sound white folks and black folks will congregate together for the art of music because it's the eye to the soul absolutely you know it's funny because i, I having interviewed um you know the reed brothers um, Sammy and Earl Reed, they talked about how, you know, there are parts of town in Dayton back then. Yeah. Uh, and there are places uh, like, let's say, the Rat Cellar or, you know, the Diamond Club and different places uh, where the neighborhood, you know, uh, wasn't necessarily um, very hospitable, you know, to black folks. Uh, but if you were an artist up there playing blues, you were kind of given this special pass that allowed you to move about, like having a, a pass in the apartheid system in South Africa, right, where you could move about, you become an honorary person with full citizenship rights because you play the music, yes. you know. Um, and, and there are still some restrictions on you, of course, but people moved around in these places that people think are these iron walls a separation, music has a way to hurdle over them. Yes, it does. And it did in this story as well. And, and, and that's why I, I think that when we, when we look at the social structures and we look at the cultural environments, that the engineering environments that we come mm -hmm. from, music, no matter who it is, from whatever level of life you are, Mm -hmm. Music has a common fabric mm -hmm. by, in, in, in the tapestry yeah. of their lives. Mm -hmm. And we make those exceptions mm -hmm. to, yeah. to, to allow that to thrive. Even sure. though it's like a flower that opens up, it'll close back down once it's mm -hmm. gone. But for that moment in time, mm -hmm. the flower will be open. And, and, and I think that as we, during these times that, the, the idea of promoting a funk, mm -hmm. your, you know, the importance of your book, 
the importance of our history, mm -hmm. of how we got here. And, and I think that uh, point of community, mm -hmm. because during the, once upon a time when we were segregated, mm -hmm. we were a community. Yeah, we were a community. And, and I think that's what people misunderstand. And, and there's some books that deal with this, but when people argued for integration, they were arguing for different kinds of things. Some people were just saying, we want our fair share. Some people weren't saying, okay, we want to, you know, break up the community, we want to move. We just want access to the same kinds of resources. So there's a way that these words, integration, segregation, really don't capture all of the nuance that happened, that happened at the time. And I think that um, through the music, I have chosen to tell a bigger story through music, and I find that that is a, is a, a way forward. The chapter that follows um, the discussion about the commercial world and the, and the companies is really going to be about exactly what we were talking about before, funk as memory, funk as nostalgia, funk as a reference point, along with this whole kind of um, emphasis on old school, and Funk's future. Funk's future. And so first we have all this effort to kind of romanticize the period because for many of us, as you follow the age of the community, those are good days in terms of the way that we think back on our lives. So, But then there is the question of succession. Who are the Funketeers? of tomorrow. And so I engage some of that. Uh, there are artists like, for instance, uh, Childish Gambino. I don't know if you uh, got to see the movie Get Out. Did you see the movie Get Out yet? Okay, well, it's, it's a thriller. But it starts off with this song that sounds like a Bootsy song. Okay. It's very funky. And with all of the uh, old school instrumentation in it and, and the falsetto singing, and the artist is named Childish Gambino. So he's a younger artist, certainly, certainly younger than uh, a lot of the funk artists that we talk about here in this story, but it's an example of a continuity. So at the end of the book, I want to deal with those kinds of continuities so that it's not just a story that has a kind of rise and fall where you say, wow, man, we had all this going on and then it all fell apart and th those were the good old days and then you end. See, that as an activist, my job is to inspire people to move forward. And so that's where I would like to kind of push the envelope to think about continuities and institution building going forward. Well, I think that, you know, when you think about that, that that's so important that we don't romanticize the past and, and, and show that the present is hopeless. Right. <laughs> so therefore, yeah. there's no hope for there's the future. There's no hope for, for the, the future. future, right. And, yeah. and so it's very important mm -hmm. that we show a continuum. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a lifespan, you know? Yeah. You, you, you know, you've got a beginning, a middle, and, and, but you got to keep it going. Now, and and it, what we're talking about right now leads us all the way back to what we started off with. It's legacy, mm -hmm. and and legacy is not necessarily concrete, right? But it's fluid. It's fluid. It's in you. It's in me, and That's it's everything right. else that we can yeah. touch to 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 move it on. And I mean, that's why I'm just so delighted to have a Dr. Scott Brown who has chosen to do this laborious <laughs> l l research. <laughs> yes. That uh, on a project that mm -hmm. will ha be uh, a legacy uh, of the Funk Museum, the Funk Hall of Fame, the Funk Exhibition Hall, the, the Funk Educational Center, Center, and the Funk Center. The, and, 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 and these things are, you know, the vision, the difficulty with being a visionary is living in today and trying to show people tomorrow. That's right. And that's what you're doing, and that's what David Webb and, and the folks that are working with this project are doing. That's right. I even get accused of being from Dayton. 
because people can't believe somebody would want to tell this story unless they have some kind of direct investment in it. And I said, I'm telling the story because it's the truth and it's the music that I love. And it's the story that needs to be told. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Scott Brown. This is Ryan McGlynn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, keep it funky. Thank <laughs> you.